So we've been in this uh, little, just a brief excursus into the Psalms. And I told you when we started, I didn't have a theme. I just kind of just picked some Psalms that, uh, that I liked and just wanted to preach on them. And I said that, you know, perhaps at the end of this, a theme will develop. And I don't know if uh, you've noticed any themes, any overlapping themes, but to me, I, I, I see this as sort of a series on uh, vantage points. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to understand what these psalmists are writing in their time, a time where they're, they have a different perspective on things, not just culturally, but uh, eschatologically. You know, we are looking, we're not looking to what they were looking for. We are looking towards the end as we are uh, received the Spirit of God. So things take on a bit of a, a different perspective for us as we look at these psalms and try to understand them and try to apply them to our lives. And so today is uh, no different. I see this as sort of the culmination, and I didn't plan it that way. It just sort of uh, happened that way. As this psalmist is speaking of this pilgrimage, oh, desiring to see and be in the presence of God, the, the, the temple courts, and he's remarking on all that he's seeing and, and is just ex so excited. Well, when we look at that for ourselves and we apply that to our lives today, we're not looking to go to a Jerusalem, a, a old Jerusalem or a temple court, dig up Solomon's temple and put it back together again. That's not what we're looking for. That's not where our heart and our pilgrimage is towards. We're looking to a different place. And so this is applicable, but it takes on a different vantage point for us. And so we'll, we'll get to that and we'll see where, um, we'll ask some questions. Maybe we'll answer them as well. Amen. Amen. So it's titled, For the Director of Music, According to Giddith, of the song Sons of Korah. We talked about this Giddith. It's a, uh, perhaps a technical term. We're not sure exactly what it means, but it's per perhaps a musical technical term. And we talked about this last week, the sons of Korah. These were the descendants of the sons of Korah. This Korah was the one that led this rebellion. He was a Levite against Moses and Aaron. And so God told Moses, separate yourself from them. Uh, and he opened up the earth and swallowed them whole. Uh, all those that rebelled against uh, Aaron and Moses. But his sons did not partake in that rebellion. And so here we see these are the descendants of the sons of Korah. And so it's a psalm, he says. And so here in verse 1 through 3 it reads, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Do you, do you hear this, uh, this excitement, this eagerness, this sort of anxiety in this psalmist's voice? He's saying, my entire being is, is sort of overwhelmed. My, my heart, my mind, my flesh, it even cries out, yearns for the living God. Now, we, one thing we have to understand that this was, we understand this to be a psalm of a pilgrimage. Uh, all of, you know, they didn't, all of Israel didn't get to live in Jerusalem and be near the temple all the time. And many lived out in the, the, the boonies. And so there were three appointed feasts every year that men ages 13 and above, they had to come and present themselves. It wasn't that it was, uh, they had to, they desired to, but scripture commanded they do this. And so for some, these were the only times that they could come and be in the temple courts, to be in the temple and, and, and worship God with Israel as a whole. And so I see this eagerness and this desire in this psalmist's voice, perhaps even me, when I read this, I, I, I get the feeling that it's perhaps their first time. Their first time visiting the temple, partaking in one of these festivals. Perhaps they uh, 
there, the Mishnah tells us there were exceptions made for those uh, that couldn't because of health reasons or because of uh, financial constraints, that they, they would not have to come and present themselves. But I get the sense, and just me personally, I get the sense that this is perhaps their first time they've heard so much about this experience, and they so desired to come and be in the Lord's presence. And they're making this journey, this pilgrimage, and they're, they're, they're remarking on everything that they see. And he says, oh, my soul, my heart, my flesh cries out to the living God. Do you see that? And he says, even the sparrow has found a home, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Now see these the courts were open. And so this is likely that there were birds that were nesting near the altars or even in the temple eaves. It was open to the air. And so uh, I, you can look at this literally and look at it metaphorically. It, perhaps they're saying that, you know, God, he just, in his lowliest creature can approach him and be in his presence. And he's just remarking upon this. That, wow, even the birds of the air, we, what a mighty God, what a loving God Amen. we serve. And that they could just come and, 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 and find rest. It could be looked at as one that is perhaps searching, going from place to place. As birds often fly from land to land looking for somewhere to find rest. What comes to mind is Christ's words. He says, come to me. All you who are heavy burdened, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. I, I, I can see in this psalmist's words, I hear it, that he's just, just so overwhelmed with seeing what he's seeing and experiencing what he's experiencing. And he says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. They're ever praising you. He's most likely referring to the Levites as they were charged, uh, they were privileged, I'd say, to be in service of the Lord. And so they had the opportunity to go where others couldn't go, and they were just ministering to the Lord. And he's remarking on this, perhaps a bit envious, saying, wow, they get to praise you. They get to be in your presence all the time, all the time. And then he pauses. He says, Salah. Depending on what translation you have. Uh, Salah. Stop for a moment. Think about that. Ponder it. Stop the music. Let us pause for a moment and reflect on that, what he's just said. If we were having a conversation with this guy, what would we say? What would we respond to him in his, as he's recounting uh, his experience of going to the temple and, and, and seeing all that he's seeing and remarking on all that he's remarking upon? And perhaps this is his first time. We don't know. We can only speculate. And he's just so thrilled to be in the presence of the Lord. What would we say to him? I mean, amen. amen. We have a different vantage point. We have an entirely different perspective on that because we are not voyaging. We've talked about this. We're not voyaging anywhere. We're not traveling anywhere to go to be uh, close to the Lord. I hear people talk about this all the time. I, I, I want to be closer to the Lord. I, 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 and they, they go and they search all these health, uh, help, self-help books and and listening to different people on how different to pray and how to pray and what all these things you have to do to be closer to the Lord. And we've talked about this. We've talked about this. We talk about this inundation of the Lord, that we are in Christ. The Spirit of Christ is in us. And so we are just so saturated with God. And so how closer can you be? How closer can you be other than to remove the obstacles in your life, the things that take your eyes off of God to be closer to him? He's there. You don't have to find some new fanciful, fanciful fairy tale way to, to reach him. You're not searching for him in a locality. He's in the heart. He's in your heart. What obstacle stands in the way? How closer can you be? Think about that, he says. Salah. What would you say to this psalmist as he's remarking? How would you compare your worship experience? 
You know, we, we got it good when you think about it. You know, we're not having to go on a pilgrimage. You know, would, how would we explain our worship experience to him? Well, let me tell you about how things are with me. You know, I, I have God in me. As a matter of fact, I am the temple. The Spirit of God lives in me, and I can worship Him. I always have reason to give Him the glory. I always have reason to praise Him. I wake up in the morning, and He's there with me. I can praise Him. Oh, you just don't know how good it is. Everywhere I go, He's with me. He's guiding me. I can hear His voice speaking to me, leading me here this way and leading me that way, telling me not to go that way. Would we be so... In our words, explaining our worship experience, will we be so anxious and so eager as this psalmist is here? Would we be honest? You know, this psalmist, he's on a, this pilgrimage. And likewise, we are also are on this pilgrimage. He's on this pilgrimage to the temple to be with his God. And likewise, we are on this pilgrimage to that holy place. We, we like to say that uh, the kingdom is already, but not yet. It's already been initiated, but is yet to be inaugurated. We are already living as kingdom citizens, but it's not yet here. It's already initiated. We're already citizens of that kingdom, but yet we're yet to step foot in it. And so, yes, we are on that pilgrimage to that holy place. Just as this psalmist is on this pilgrimage to that holy place, eyes focused to enter into those narrow gates. And so are we. So are we. Would we be so eager to explain our worship experience? Would we be honest with them and say, you know, God is with me all the time, you know, and, but, you know, it's hard sometimes because sometimes I get myself into a mess. And he doesn't leave me. He's there. I hear him. I hear him talking to me. I hear him looking at me. I see him looking at me. I know that he's there. And I'm so ashamed at times. I wish he'd turn his eyes from me, but I could just see those piercing, gazing eyes upon me while I'm in my mess. Would we explain that to him as well? You know, when, you know, when somebody just gets on your last nerve, just your last nerve. You don't have any more. And you want to tell them exactly what you're thinking. You want to tell them exactly what you feel. And this is the, the most effective communication that we can come up with. Because we can tell somebody exactly how we feel. And there's no misunderstanding about what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're going through. We can tell them. And it, 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 it comes so easily. We don't have to sit and research it and think about it. It can just come and flow off the flick of the tongue like a tidal wave, like a tsunami crashing on the shores. We can do that. And sometimes you want to. Sometimes it just gets right there and we hear that voice. What are you about to say? What are you doing? And it just, oh, Lord have mercy. Or sometimes we just let the, the tidal waves roar. And afterwards, we say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy. He's with me. He's watching me. Do we do that? Nobody's going to confess. I'll confess. I do that. I do that. Amen. I do that. Amen. I do that. I struggle with that. Y'all got to pray for me. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this is what's going to really jar you, because I do it at the worst place. I, I do it at the worst place. I do it here at the church. Oh, Lord, help us. And let me explain. Amen. I appreciate it. Pray for me. You know, y'all remember that mud puddle we had out there for, for about six months? You know, I did that. I can confess. That was me. I did that. I had some help, but I did it. You know, and I, I, I was trying to get it ready for someone to come in and do it, and then they backed out at the last minute. It wasn't their fault. They just couldn't find the material. And so it sat there. It looked so terrible for like six months. And every day I came in and looked at it, and it was just eating away at me. Just, oh, oh, every day. I didn't even want to go out there and look. 
And then so finally spring came around and I was like, whatever we need to do, let's just get it done. I'm tired of looking at it. And then we did. We got it done and it was wonderful. It was beautiful. It's beautiful, isn't it? And so sometimes I go out there and I'd just be walking and just, just admiring, enjoying God's creation and looking at it and just, just filled with euphoria. And then one day the schools let out. And I'm sitting here looking at this and enjoying this. And let me tell you, children, they, they see things entirely different than we do. They have different types of vision. They have different types of realities. Because what I saw when I looked at that was all the, the hard work, all the blood, sweat, and tears, the planning, the meeting, the budgeting, all that went into getting that done. They don't see that. What they see are obstacles. They saw an obstacle course. They saw the opportunity to go and sit down on something that where in the world would you imagine that that is a place to sit down? A, a place to go and pick leaves and pick the little leaves off the trees and just that, that's what they saw. And I'm sitting there looking at this and let me tell you what I don't need to tell you. You know <laughs> You know, Lord, forgive me. Lord, not at the church. Oh, Lord, oh, I need a new heart. Give me a new heart. It happens. We, we lose sight. And this is what I'm learning. It's so easy to lose sight on that destination to where we are pilgrimaging to. And when we do that, we start to look at all the things that really don't really even matter. You know, because we're on this voyage we're on this pilgrimage and we're focused in on those narrow gates and, and this is a place that where no moth can break in and, and it can't destroy and the thief can't break in and destroy and the children, they can't come in and trample all over your azaleas. It's a place where we enter in through that narrow gate. You know, it's something so much more precious than anything that this life could ever offer. And so when we focus on that, that that is the destination Everything just seems to not really even matter. We've got to remind ourselves that we're on this pilgrimage to keep our eyes focused on those narrow gates, to enter in through those narrow gates. Amen? Amen. It's written, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. This valley of Baca that the psalmist is uh, speaking of, this word Baca, at its root it means to weep. Some translations will render it that way, to weep or to mourn. And so this valley we're talking about is perhaps this, this, it's named after these trees that would uh, secrete uh, this sort of sap that would give the appearance that it was weeping. And this is why they would name these trees, these Baca trees. And so we think that this was a valley that was sort of riddled with all these uh, Baca trees. But we can look at this literally, we could take it, look at it metaphorically, we could do both. As we go through on this pilgrimage, we go through valleys. We go through desolate places. We go through times of weeping. We go through times of mourning, times of anxiety, times of just frustration, times of anger. We go through some dry places sometimes. I don't need to tell you about it. You've done there. You've been there, done that. A lot of us are going through some dry places right now. But look at what he says. They make it a place of springs. Those that are set out on this pilgrimage, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. The pilgrims make it a place of springs. They leave behind sustenance. They make it a blessing. And we know this to be true as those that have gone before us on this walk, this pilgrimage that we're upon, They've left behind blessings. They've told us where to look. They've said, you know, I've walked this road that you're walking. I've encountered these things that I know that you're going to encounter. When you go through this, you ought to want to look here. When you go through that, you ought to want to turn here. You ought to be weary because this is what the enemy is going to do. 
on this road, this, this, this pilgrimage that we are on. Those that have gone before us, they've made it a spring. They've left behind blessings as we are doing the same. We're, we're telling our young ones, teaching them, raising them up, them up to, to endure this pilgrimage. Those that have begun and have finished, they've left blessings as we do the same. As those after us, until the Lord comes, will also do. We make it these desolate places, a valley of springs, these valleys of weeping. And we see here that God provides. The autumn rains cover it with pools. This is why we think this was perhaps the, I think, the festival of booths. It would coincide within this time of the year where the, the, these autumn rains. And so God called them. He knew. He knows where they're going. He knows the routes that they're going to take, and he's going to provide for them. Do you see that? We're on this pilgrimage. It's a long, winding road. And that's what pilgrimage really is, is what it's saying. It's these roads, these highways and byways. We go through all these twists and turns, and God is going to provide for you along the way. The body of Christ that's going before you, that's walking with you, are going to provide for you along the way. Don't go it alone. A lot of us try to do that. Rely on those blessings, those springs that God provides for us. Amen. Look at what he says here. He says, till each appears before God in Zion. Do you see the eschatological implications of that? You know, a lot of people... I've heard them argue that the Psalms aren't really, some of the Psalms aren't really inspired. They're Jewish tradition. And so it's just, it's just there. We, we include that. But if this isn't uh, as prophetic as it wants to be, I don't know what is. Uh, 1 Peter 2.6 tells us, well, let me say that again, till each appears before God in Zion. And then 1 Peter 2.6 2, tells us, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen, a chosen precious stone, cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Paul tells us in Romans, he says, See, I lay a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is a cornerstone in Zion. Some will stand firm on that stone. Some will stumble and fall. Do you see that? Till each appears before God in Zion. Every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess. You ought want to stand on that cornerstone. Let it not be a stumbling block to you. Some will stand, others will fall. Amen? Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. It's written. Look on our shield, O oh God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, and walk as blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This shield. Look at what he says. Lord, look upon our shield. Now, this is different for us because we're not walking around with shields and swords as those that are prepared to do battle with an invading army. We don't wrestle. We know this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy, our, our adversary is our principalities. Our shield is not one of iron or steel or bronze or Kevlar. Our shield is one of faith. Amen? We put on the armor of God, and he's saying, look at uh, Lord, look on our shields. We, we don't have shields of carnality. We have spiritual shields. And what this, I, I see this as the author of Hebrews. He tells us, let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Our shield, we look to Christ to perfect it. We look to Christ to strengthen it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. For better is one day as a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than a thousand to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Here, again, this psalmist, he's been on this pilgrimage, so excited, so anxious to arrive 
at the Holy Land, at the promised, the temple to, to worship God, to be in his presence, to behold all that there is to behold. He's reaching that destination. But again, it's a little different for us because we're not looking to Jerusalem. We're not looking to Solomon's temple or even the second temple. We're not looking to reconstruct some locality. Our promise, our eyes are focused on the eschaton. At the end, our eyes are focused on that holy place. And John, he tells us that, you know, I saw a new city, a new Jerusalem, and I didn't see a temple. I didn't see it. I saw the living almighty God, and I saw the Lamb of God, and they were the temple. Our eyes are set on that temple. Enter in through those narrow gates, he tells us. We're on this pilgrimage, and it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to look to the left and to look to the right, but he tells us, enter in through those narrow gates. Just as excited as this psalmist is to embark upon this pilgrimage to visit the temple, to be, to worship with his God and his people. So are we on this pilgrimage, set out on that holy place, that eschaton, the end. This is why he says, endure to the end. Endure to the very end. He will provide. We will sustain one another as we pass through these valleys. We make it springs. Amen. But our eyes, keep your eyes focused on the eschaton. Focused on those narrow gates to enter therein. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this word. And thank you for that reminder just to focus on you. How easy it is to get distracted, how easy it is to turn aside and, uh, and just weary, be weary over all the things that come our way. Lord, we just, we look to you for guidance. We look to you to continue us on in this path. May we focus on this journey, this pilgrimage as we seek out your, you, because you are the temple. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity is to walk with you, to walk with one another. Thank you for this plan. Thank you, Father. Just thank you. We cannot thank you enough. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Sustain us to the very end. We know that you will. May we focus on you till the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.